All right, we have a special guest for everyone today, a returning lineup guest. It is the third time, is what I've been told. Uh, those are Jack Robinson numbers. I'm pretty excited about this. <laughs> Listeners are going to know him from his great work on things like the electric acid surfboard test, Stab in the Dark, and of course, No Contest, which just premiered its new season this week on Red Bull TV. He's been all over the world, filming, producing, gathering content, and telling the stories from the surfing world with a depth, um, all while building out a, a new family. He's expecting his first son, so congratulations to you and your partner there. We Thank have once much. again uh, Stab's editor-at-large and producer extraordinaire Ashton Goggins. Ashton, thank you so much for joining us on The Light Up. Oh, thanks for having me back, Dave. It's a pleasure. Now, I, I, I'm, as someone who is a social media follower and fan of yours, I've seen you've been all over the map recently, but where are you uh, talking to us from today? Um, I'm at home in Hawaii. Uh, I'm at my wife's and I's little cottage on the North Shore. Uh, I was hoping that the landscaping that was going on around us constantly would quiet down and we are getting a lull in the storm. But I live over on like a really rural part of the North Shore, like sort of proper country. It's a lot of like agricultural land and horse ranches and stables and stuff um, and no waves. But uh yeah, I just got home last night after a little week tour from Austria to San Francisco show in the first two episodes of this season of No Contest, and I'm so psyched to be home. Uh, living in Hawaii is the first <laughs> place I've ever lived where I'm like totally, completely happy to be home. I usually am like so psyched to be leaving wherever I've lived, and uh, yeah, especially with our Grom on the way, it's nice to be back and hopefully here for a little bit um, until we decide locations and get back on the road again next year. Right. And and I know we've talked about it on not one, but two podcasts before. And, you know, you grew up in Florida, you did time in New York, California, and, and now Hawaii. How long have you been in Hawaii? And, and what was the catalyst for that decision? And not only the decision to move to Hawaii, I think most surfers are going to be like, we don't need that answer. We got it. But mostly to that part of Hawaii and, and setting up home base for someone who's Careers fairly nomadic. Um, you know, what was what was the decision making think, uh, process like? Um, I'd probably spent four or five months a year in Hawaii for the last ten years now, and I'd always thought in the back of my head that if I could ever find a place here that was like the right situation, that I would pull the trigger and like justify it. And a place popped up like two and a half years ago when we were here. Like the day we were leaving, a friend of ours, this guy Bobby, who's an electrician here in Paliva um was at third stone where i build a lot of boards and a factory that i work with now uh, and was like oh hey these cottages that i know of you know down the street are opening up i'll you know see what the story is and he called us over and we met the landlord and he's a surfer that's been here since the late 80s lived here since the 70s and he has this like gorgeously maintained property um pretty close to a couple little waves and we like couldn't say no so part of it was thinking about having a kid, Julia and I, um, she's from Brazil and for her dealing with citizenship, we have to be in the United States at least like six months out of the year. So it was a way that we could settle down in a place that kind of still feels like a little bit of a surf trip. Um, and the area that we're at is like such a perfect little quiet, like rural corner of Hawaii for raising kids. It's like a choose your own adventure. We have little packs of feral kids that run up and down the street chasing chickens and running out to the beach to go ride boogie boards. And it's like really small town Hawaii vibes. It's pretty cool. So at least for the, you know, the indeterminate future, we're here. I've got a bunch of projects going on here. And it was sort of the reasoning was for me, like as far as storytelling goes and like raw material, as far as characters and board builders and history and like, the stuff that I'm like interested in doing and telling stories about Hawaii is the beating part of it. It's every day I go out and I run into someone who growing up, I would have like dreamed about being able to sit down and hang out with. And right. yeah, I get to go and like have a cup of coffee with Al Chapman every morning and like, you know, see John Pizel or like a bunch of, you know, the local shapers around here. There's like 20 world-class shapers that build boards within like probably 15 minutes in my house 
So for me, right. it's like, it's the, it's what I always hope the surf industry would feel like as far as like the sixties surf industry of people that build boards, you know, they, they shape boards for the local guys that want to surf waves that are just working class surfers, but also really build the best surfboards in the world. Realistically, still mostly start to finish by hand. It's like Mecca for me. Mm-hmm. So that was part of it. Yeah. And I'm, it's a, it's an appropriate point to bring up. I was having a similar thought just listening to you talk about that. Cause you know, the North shore in Hawaii, it's, it's always been the case there. Right. And through the decades, it's like, you know, the, the surfing industrial complexes, eye of Sauron may it's gaze may move to other areas, but at the end of the day, like people are always drawn back to the North shore. And I'm trying to think, I, I don't know if there's a comparison in other sports at all. I think you your comp to Mecca is appropriate. And, and the fact that surfing is probably more of a, a closely associated with a religion than anything else. But can you think of any other kind of outside of surfing examples of a place that is a nexus point, not only for world-class waves every year, but world-class surfers and shapers and people who have been woven into the fabric of, of the culture for some, in some cases, decades. Yeah. It's funny. I grew up in Sarasota, Florida, which is like 30 minutes south of, I think it's called AIG. Um, It's where the Williams sisters trained. It's where every world-class tennis star has spent most of, you know, a certain point of their year training. It's like where every prodigy goes. And that's like built into the culture of that area. It's like the tennis Mecca of the South with surfing. It's like, I feel like Southern California has, part there's places that have that you know really there are there are to me there are little hotbeds these days that have all of these things but to me why is like the it's the patient zero you know what i mean it's like where it's Mm -hmm. it's where everything started it's where everything that's relevant has come from it's where every design you know progression has been tested whatever whichever way you want to go it's like it's why like it's the gnarliest place on the planet. And the people that live here, I don't know. It's just, it's a special type of person that comes here and figures out like why they want to be here and makes it long-term. Cause you know, it is, I think it, you know, a lot of people get pushed out or feel uncomfortable after a while or get Island fever. And for me, it's like, I just can't imagine ever getting tired of living here every day. I like have a conversation with someone where I'm like, wow, I can't believe I just got to go talk to like Gordon Quigg for 40 minutes about like his dad's templates and stuff. Um, So yeah. And thinking about being able to raise a kid in that environment, I was like, that would have been my dream growing up. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that's my, uh, my paternal like uh, judo of trying to get my, make sure that my kid loves surfing for the right reasons. (laughs) <laughs> I like it. And for someone who, as long as I've known you, and I'm sure well before, has been passionate about deep storytelling within surf culture, as you point out, it's an ideal place to exist because you're probably, you know, inspired every day by just conversations you're having with people that, that are part of the fabric of the North Shore. It's very cool. And I, and I want to get back to No Contest, right? So oh, yeah. you've had a, a premiere of a couple of episodes most, if not all of our listeners are probably avid No Contest fans, but if you had to explain what it is, and it, and it also started, I guess, in a different place. So maybe maybe give us a little bit of background on how you became involved in this project, what the original intention was, and, and how it's evolved into the current season. Yes. So No Contest started, I mean, can we speak about uh, trivial brand relationships. <laughs> uh, pretty much our entire podcast. So <laughs> knock yourself out. Yeah. So I, I think that it started during a year where Red Bull and the WSL didn't have a, um, a sponsorship deal. And mm-hmm. so it was a way of filming sort of all of the surfers that were on tour doing stuff that didn't involve the events. And so it was what they would get up to behind the scenes a little bit, just little, almost like a tour note style series that was produced by stab and shot by jacob wooden by woody and then once you guys and once the wsl and red bull 
re-upped and, re, you know, uh, rekindled their flame. Uh, it became a like behind the scenes series and travel show around the world tour. So it was following the surfers through their experience being in those locations and then telling stories about the local communities, wherever they sort of, wherever those two things came together around each event. So it would be, you know, where everyone went to eat or whatever, like the local, you know, sort of vibe of each location was, it was to give people like a sense of the actual reality of like, whatever you want to call it, the dream tour. Like, what's it like to be on tour? Like, where do they eat? What do they do in the mornings? Where are they free surfing? Like, who are they meeting? What are the local guys? Um, and then over a couple of seasons, we evolved that during COVID to be a little bit more of like a podcast around some of the events and a little bit more of like a, you know, modified uh, excuse to do like more archival storytelling around some of the stuff that you guys were doing. And then once the tour was back on, it was pretty clear that we had sort of gone to each location and the strength, I think of the series for most of the people at Red Bull. And I think for the broader like audience, even beyond the surf community was that it was like more of just like a straight travel show. And so the idea with the last two seasons has been to basically like pick surf locations that have really rich culture and surf communities that are, would be a little bit unexpected and to explore places that don't necessarily, you know, have a WCT event, or if they do, it's like a, you know, an event that people might be surprised by like a QS in Israel or, you know, um, something like that. But yeah, so the, the last season we did Italy and we took Stephanie Gilmore there to travel around with um, Leo Fioravanti and a bunch of the locals with Roby D'Amico and Lorenzo Castagna and all these pioneers of Italian surfing. Um, we did Brazil, Costa Rica, Fiji, New York City, and where else? This is where the this is where you start to get lost. I have to like pull out my passport. Um, and then this season we did Morocco, San Francisco, Tahiti, and South Africa. And we just premiered Morocco in San Francisco with Laura Coviella, who is a girl from the Canary Islands, um, which are closer to Morocco than they are to Europe, even though they're Spanish islands. Um, and she was along for a couple of the trips that we did in Morocco. I ended up, I was supposed to go for like five or six days and I ended up staying for two months because... I didn't really want to leave and I didn't have to. <laughs> and so we, we ended up making a pretty radical episode as far as the depth that we were able to go to just because I was there for so long. And it coincided with like this insane run of swell. And they ran the Safi Invitational while I was there. And we got to go and shoot behind the scenes during that event, which is like the first tube riding invitational that they've done there. They basically run heats all day and then take a break as the tide gets high at night and then run the finals during the middle of the night under stadium lights. And it's a Muslim country, so there's no drinking. So everyone's on the cliffs, like these huge crowds of people just drinking mint tea and watching surfing and playing music with these giant stadium lights overlooking Safi and just these like black cylinder barrels coming down the point out of the night. Um, it was insane. But yeah, we, so Morocco was like probably one of the best trips I've ever been on. We were there with Otman Shufani, who um, I think he's gotten alternates into some of the WSL big wave events. I don't know. I know he just got a an alternate invite to the Eddy, but he's like the big wave pioneer of Morocco um, and probably one of the most like well-known surfers amongst surfers that I've ever known. Anyone that I work with in the surf world is like, do you know Otman? <laughs> And without fail, everyone knows him, but he showed us around and put us up at his friend's place, this, um, this surf lodge called Paradis Plage. And there's this whole network of guys <clears throat> within that area that are like so well connected within the government, within the surf community, within all the surf developments that have sprung up around Tagazut and Agadir and, and Imsuan. It's like a pretty cool example of surf tourism, like really like helping a region that for a long time was like, I think, perceived as being pretty raw and roots and like difficult to go mm -hmm. to or even potentially dangerous. But, you know, really demystifying and showing how 
incredibly hospitable and like warm and open of a culture it is and how you know sort of luxurious of an experience as you want to have you can have it there um and as far as waves go it's like a choose your own adventure so that episode was really special we were there for ages and we were able to do a ton of local profiles board builders and longboard kids like the full spectrum of um moroccan surfing today and we were able to bring like this whole crew of european guys um the whole pukas crew came and yeah it was a really really fun trip um and then Tahiti, we went and we went and met with Peva Levy. Have you ever met Peva when you've been in Tahiti? I've, I've met Peva, yeah. Yeah. So we got to interview Peva, like bare chest, reed hat on, sitting on the point in front of his house at Chopes to talk about like what it was like to be there in 1963 when his dad bought that entire valley and his cousin and him surfing it for the first time and sort of all of the back and forth of like the first pioneers of it. And now with what's going on with the Olympics, it was a conversation around what that community was doing to make sure that, that when you and I go to Tahiti, that it looks, or that when, to make sure that when you and I go to Chopes after the Olympics, it looks the way that it does after you guys leave an event when you're finished with it, which is, I don't know why, is it a common story? Like how well you guys deal with the logistics of hosting that event, storing the, the um, tower and all that stuff. Cause to me um, that blew my mind. I wish I would have known that going into it. Cause we would have filmed that whole space. Cause it is such a like elegant solution to not having this like thing that's just getting blasted and constantly having to be repaired sitting in the lagoon, the way that it often has to in places like Fiji where it's like, Oh, it's just a blight. Well, it's a, it, <laughs> It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And I, I probably, we probably don't get celebrated for that, but it, I think it's sort of intrinsic to how our business operates too, right? Like we, we, we have a, we're, we have an enviable position, right? We have the platform for the world's best surfing. It's great. That requires like really good relationships with the communities we go to, right? So it's something I think that's been built up almost from the beginning over these decades. And, and how are you working with, local families, how are you being, you know, sensitive to the environment? How are you trying to leave it better for the community than, than when you turned up? And it doesn't always work perfectly, I'm sure, but it's sort of self-selecting in a way. Like if we're doing a good job, we get invited back. If we're not, then we have to make changes. And uh, well, I, I think argue... that's just like a different business proposition to the Olympics, right? That's like we're coming here for one year and then we're never coming back. And it's yeah, it's a different kind of animal in a way. Yeah, I would argue that there's a very specific dynamic that exists within that community <clears throat> that you guys have been able to help preserve because they've been able to rely on a certain amount of very high paying investment each year for the entire period of time around your events. Like everyone makes money in that local community. Every person on a jet ski, every person on a boat, every person with a homestay and they get premium top dollar and they just as they should, it's French Polynesia. And each year on year, you've seen those people, you know, all of those families have been able to invest in their properties and make them nicer and like offer more, you know, a little bit more infrastructure here and there. And it's like a totally like organic paste, growth that corresponds like in a sustainable way to what that place can with you know sort of withstand and at this point like there's not that many places you can say that about you know what i mean maybe pavones in costa rica because of all of the legalities around the land down there being owned by you know danny fowley and you know drug dealers and stuff like that but for the most part everywhere else is like bought up and it it doesn't have that same like it go, you know, anything that happens there, it allows them to not have to like rely upon this huge tourism industry throughout the entire year to sustain their livelihoods. They can make their money for a month here and a month there when there's big events and when big swells come in the same thing. It's like, that's like it, the demand is like based on like the actual organic like needs of people want that want to go surf that wave or the events that are around it. Um, yeah. It's not a tourist destination. It's a good point. I mean, I think that even in those locations where 
it is all bought up for the purposes of the WSL at like whatever level, like regional QS, Challenger Series, Championship Tour, like at whatever level, it's still incumbent upon us to work with the community and the people that were there first in, in almost every way. Like otherwise yeah. it doesn't work. And 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 that's a huge part of you know what we do when we come to the North Shore, what we do when we go to Bell's yeah. Beach, what we do when we go to Tahiti. And you know, back to to no contests, as we were kind of talking about in the upfront. You know, Hawaii is is almost inarguably and unimpeachably like considered surfing's mecca, but there all are all these hubs, as you mentioned, you know, there's San Clemente and Santa Cruz, there's the Gold Coast, there's Bells Beach, there's Hasagor, there's Sakurama, there, and it, it feels like no contest has done such a good job of building the the muscle and the storytelling muscle around these communities in a really authentic way. I'm curious since you've done a number of these at this point all these communities are unique obviously but you're coming to it through a surfing lens are there things that you found that are universal across each of these communities and if so what are those and just looking at the the, the first four episodes of this season uh there's no contest you mentioned san francisco morocco tahiti south africa what were some of the major differences that you saw um, just in these communities this season that's a loaded question dave uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so what I love about doing this series is that it, I feel like it's, it allows me to like exercise tools that I've learned doing any number of different disciplines throughout my life, whether it was being a journalist, being a documentary filmmaker, or a food writer, but then also just being a like vagabond traveling surfer. And for me, like the, the, a successful surf trip wasn't just scoring waves. It was like the, the, it was meeting like the real local, like heroes of each location, whether it was a board builder or a guy that ran the local shop forever, or, you know, the people that, that have run the local, like whatever the cafe or local restaurant that everybody loves is. And like feeling like that you've gotten a sense of like what's important to each place as well as like scoring waves. And a lot of times doing, surf media it's a fairly like exploitative transaction with most of those communities you're flying to a location when there's waves you're filming a pro surfer and then you're making something out of it and you know at most you might premiere it in that location and they might be psyched because the guy was cool to surf with but a lot of times they're like bummed about it you know i've i won't mention surfers names but there's surfers that have done projects in a lot of these locations that were like incredible super long form, beautiful, like tons of footage, you know, shot over long periods of time with very little like local story or presence at all. And where I would think that these people would be like super celebrated because they made this like amazing film that was shot there. A lot of times they're like, fuck that guy, you know, like he didn't do anything for us. Um, and, you know, burned us or talked shit or, you know, whatever. So for me, it's like, being able to like navigate that world through the relationships that I've built over the years, like that to me was like, for me, like my dream of being like a successful, like surf person, just a surfer to me is someone that feels comfortable anywhere around the world in all these different like surf communities, because you've met these people through all, you know, just interactions in all these different locations. And at this point, I feel like I've done that. And so filming these, a lot of times I'm able, I know going in that I'm going to be able to tell stories around, around people that I know and love and like have spent time with and understand the like complexity of their stories. And through them, I've already have a somewhat of a familiarity with the locations. So with like South Africa, for instance, we got to go with Alan Van Geisen, who has been, he was on the Morocco trip too, as a photographer and, uh, and camera operator as well. But on in South Africa, he was like the star and the guide of it. And for me, Alan is like Crocodile Dundee. He's like the like Dr. Livingston of surf exploration. And he's one of the most incredibly like knowledgeable and well-traveled and like well-spoken individuals that I've ever spent any time with. And I've been lucky to make a ton of projects with him. He shot the, the first acid test with Dane, the acid test with Steph. He shot the... Um, the take it easy on the Zambezi trip, the river surfing wave documentary that we did for vans in, uh, in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Um, 
And so he was our guide for South Africa. And so we started the trip in Durban during the Bolito Pro, which was such a sick event to be there for. We cruised around with Kolohe and the 2% crew while they were there, like dominating. And the waves were firing the entire event. It was like world-class, perfect, flat bottom, square beach break barrels for like two weeks. And cruised around Durban. We, we went into Durban City and did a profile on this kid. Uh, have you ever met Surprise while you've been in South Africa? Little goofy foot, they call him Baby Italo. Little no. surprise. Uh, I've been so, to South so, Africa in a few years though. So, so I met Surprise the first year I was on tour doing no contest with uh, when we were there for the J Bay event, and he was out during all the free surfs. And he is this tiny little Zulu kid. He was probably thirteen years old at the time, and just this like fierce little like stocky backhand, but just like paddling at the point, talking to everybody, chatting up everyone, like the funniest little personality, and. I'd seen clips of him recently, like fucking ripping. And he's still just this tiny little Zulu kid. Like you remember the Zulu, I can't remember the, the Zulu guy's name from Endless Summer 2 that they met. But oh, the whole yeah, thing yeah, is, I know that's their size. About. They're very short. And, um, so his father, uh, they call him Baby Jakes, uh, has run Jason Ribbing's Channel Island Surfboard Factory in Durban for like 25 years. Um, and surprise, grew up like on the Durban beachfront. Um, and in that surfboard factory and he's the raddest most well-spoken cool little kid he's like 17 years old now he's not a little kid he he comes off like he's like a like classically trained mannered like gentleman for 17 years old he's amazing um but so we cruised around with him and sort of uh saw the surfboard industry uh, Graham Smith and Jordy have their factory on the same street as Jason Ribbing, right in, um, it's, called, it's a street called Hunter Street, where there's like four or five different board brands that operate out of there. They do all the Lost, CIs, Smith Shapes, um, and then Built, which Damien Farinfort and him are partners in. They, they have Built in the USA now too. Um, but it's been like the beating heart of surfboard um, as far as manufacturing goes since like the 1960s. Uh, Graham and those guys, like all, they all got their start in that guy, Max Wetlands factory, which that's who like took Bruce Brown and those guys around in endless summer one when they came through. Um, so it's like, so roots. It's like, for me, it, it was like a joke. There's like, fin there's boards that were built from like that era and tons of photos and stuff on the wall. It was like an embarrassment of riches, how rad that zone was. Um, and then we also went to Island style. Did you know that Island Style was a South African owned and manufactured brand? I did know that. I, I had the good fortune of uh, cutting my teeth for the ASP uh, alongside Pierre Toasty. So I got a good education on South Africa in those first few years. Uh, we went and hung out with Waza, with Warren Waring, the, the owner of Island Style, who yeah. I didn't know. And I have to fact check this, but I put it in there because a guy like that is his, 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 as good as gospel. But... He said that he was the first person to build a two board board bag, the first person to build a comp leash, the first person to build a wet dry bag. And they still manufacture everything in South Africa. He sent me this video of like their Friday afternoon, like dance party. It's like all these ladies from all the different villages around Durban that all work in the factory, like hand stitching all their board bags, like the most beautiful handiwork. And they throw these big like lunch parties every day and everyone like sort of sends it while they're working. Um, and pretty much everybody that I talked to there was like, dude, it's been one of the like most, as far as working in the city, it's like one of the most like coveted jobs to work for Waza if you're like in that zone. But uh, yeah, I got a custom board bag made, like a 10-6, four board, long board bag. <laughs> There you go. Now that but, now that now that Hawaii now that Hawaiian Airlines has a hundred pound limit flying between the mainland and Hawaii. I saw that. We can thank uh four time Piahe winner Billy Kemper for oh, advancing I, a conversation on that. It's a, one of his uh greatest achievements. Big wave world champ and the reducer of airline fees for surfers <laughs> flying to and from Hawaii. That, like that it'll, be in, it'll it'll be in his Wikipedia page. That's some people's champ. I love it. We're going to take 100%. a quick, quick break to get a word in from our sponsor, and we will be right back. 
So for this next segment, because we have had you on a couple of times, we had you on, as I've been told, episode 12, so early on, and episode 124, this is going to be episode 174, so it's nice, we're, we're, it's like the singularity, the intervals are getting shorter and shorter, which is really important, so soon you'll just be like an everyday guest, but, Let's you know, a few episodes ago, I had the good fortune of um, talking to Matt George about the book that he's released of his uh, collection of a, a, of a cross selection of his writings from the last several decades called in deep really enjoyed the conversation. I hadn't had, I hadn't had the opportunity to talk to him for that long before. And um, he's one of those guys and there's a class of, of, of guys, uh, unfortunately it probably is just guys that you and I being of a certain age, probably read growing up in ser- in terms of surf storytelling. And I- I'm curious as to, what your current role is at STAB, and I think a lot of listeners would be as well, because there isn't an abundance of surf media out there anymore, surf magazines, there's not that trajectory of, I'm going to be an intern, and then like, you know, I'm going to be a contributing writer, and then I'm going to work my way up and be associate editor and senior editor, and then editor in chief, and just doesn't exactly exist anymore. But, But STAB seems to be putting out as much content as possible through a number of different mediums. But for our listeners benefit, can you kind of walk through your history with them? Like how you started, what roles you've had and what, what your current role uh, kind of uh, exists to do? Yeah. So I, so I started out at surfer um, sort of the tail end of when they were starting to close surfing magazine. And I was there right at the sort of height of the like rivalry between the, the, the more postmodern rivalry between the publications. And, uh, at a certain point surfing closed and they absorbed some of the employees of the magazine into surfer. So I went to be like a field editor for surfer. And as I was traveling around doing, you know, stories, I, I think I went to Europe for like a few months and did a feature on the Canary islands and came back. And I had sort of pushed for surfer to do, a lot more than they were to try to sort of create business. I thought that it was like pretty just sort of lazy to sit around and wait for the print model to like come back around. And they weren't really investing in films and documentaries and like sort of proper surf movies as much as I felt like they could have. And I had a different idea of what it was going to be than sitting in an office in Carlsbad like writing about, you know, sort of editing other people's stories about surf trips, then going and like making projects happen. Um, and so I met Sam McIntosh from Stab a few times in Hawaii and ran into each other at Malibu with his family and at Topanga over the years. And we were surfing a little sandbar in Marina del Rey, I'll call it. And had a nice conversation. He texted me that night and was like, Hey, would you be interested in sitting down? Like I'm buying back stab. Cause at that point it was still owned by surf stitch. And so we had a meeting and he showed me the, the doc, the Vulcan video that they did, uh, the very first one running off the dock in, in Bali. And he told me the story about how he had like told him, like, if this doesn't get a million views in a week or whatever, it's on us or whatever, like fully rolled the dice and, that was like his first big project after they, they bought back stab and asked me if I wanted to be their editor in chief. And for me, it was like a dream. I was like, Oh, to like run a surf magazine with someone who's young and like sees all these different media platforms and what they're doing. Cause at that time, Sam was already talking about like paywall ideas and premium subscriptions and like how to diversify what it was that like stab magazine was. So I came on board and me, Morgan Williamson and Mikey Ceramella and Rory Parker, um, Jake Howard and sort of a, a, a group of us all sort of started trying to build Stab into a bit more of a like full functioning digital you know, site as far as news, still trying to do a little bit of the industry in trading gossipy stuff. Um, while trying to figure out how to make surf films as a production company. And so at that point they had done the first two stab in the darks, which were sort of there at that point, like high watermark as far as like impactful 
surf films. They'd also done the Remembering Ricardo film when mm-hmm. Ricardo Dos Santos died, which I thought was like one of the best films that they ever made with, um, who made that? I'm going to feel bad not knowing who, who made that movie. I know that Bruno Zanin worked on it, but anyhow. Um, but yeah, there was a couple projects where I was like, oh, if this is what they were doing all the time, it would be insane. Like it would be like the vice of surfing if you could develop that. And so over time, we started doing more and more projects with narratives and sort of trying to figure out, you know, at that point, it was still, you know, a a lot of algorithmic confusion around like, where do you put, you know, full length videos? Like, how do you get stuff out there? And Sam started coming up with a few like sort of prototypes for what would eventually become Stab Premium. There was at one point, there was one called Quiet Corner that was like a tipping service for projects where like, if you like something, you could be like, oh, thanks. Um, but it, uh, you know, none of them really ever like took shape for about the first two or three years that I was there. And at that time we started developing a bunch of other like bigger projects that were all disseminated through films and episodic series. We started doing the first stab highs. We did the electric acid surfboard test. We started doing a bunch of like branded series for, um, monster and red bull. We started doing no contest. And it just sort of started to like blossom as far as like the ecosystem is with the, with filmers and editors and like the crews that we had sort of built relationships with who sort of started to set the tone for what a stab project looked like. And a huge part of that is Shinya Dalby, who's the creative director at stab, who's I think probably the most irreplaceable and like broadly, uh, prolific contributor to stab of all time. He's basically made stab look like what it looks, which is, I think a huge undertaking diversifying every, you know, project and having it still look and feel like one media brand. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just became sort of the focus of the business to a certain extent, you know, and then the premium model came about, I think for Sam, it was about creating a platform for really good writing that had a budget that was just independent, that people could write whatever they wanted. It, it you know, they, it was, uh, you know, the New York Times model mixed with the like sort of streaming service model. So you were paying for high quality interviews, journalism, reporting, and then high production, short films, documentaries, you know, episodic series, branded content occasionally. Um, And we started to like develop that during COVID um, when I was making Andy Irons and the Radicals and they were starting to make the stab highs like on location as episodic release, like competitions. Um, and so those are the two projects that along with stab in the dark, I think with Taj were the first three like stab premium projects, like bang, bang, bang that we released. And then the electric acid surfboard test with Mason and Coco and, you know, it sort of went on from there and, it's cool to see the ecosystem work and like validate the business model. Because I think for me, it's, it, it's, it's, there's been like, there is strangely been like surf media wars over the last 10 years. And I think a lot of people thought that stab was like trying to like sink everyone because they basically would like grab anybody that was talented that wanted to make something cool and try and like figure out how for they, that they can make it. And that's like, I think the dream for them is for brands and surfers to want to come to them and make stuff. Or if they're, they are making something cool to want to put it on their platform. And they've done a great job of creating that incentive and that community, um, which I think has been one of the bigger, like small business stories in surfing as far as like, there's not that many like new media out there that's developed a completely different business model and uh, customer base of subscribers that I can think of really besides, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some like influencer, like only fans and stuff. <laughs> well, and so, so with your role now as editor at large, like how would you describe that to someone? Are so, you, are you, are you I don't even know getting I, the keyboard out. Are you, are you writing anything textual no. these days? <laughs> is it, I, I listen editor, to the, the Bill Simmons podcast on the ringer network and it, it's interesting because a lot of them are like, they don't write anymore. They're like, we, we produce, you know, documentaries and we do podcasts, but they still have quite a lot of reverence for writing as a medium. And so every now and then they'll yeah. talk about, 
I'm going to pick the pen up again and do, you know, and it's like a big deal. I don't know if that translates to what you do or the surfing world as much, or if you're like no, not 100%. happy to use a different medium these days. Um, so in the surf world, for the most part, I've just been doing no contest this year. I'm still, I'm, I've been working on a bunch of different projects actually outside of my role at stab. My role at stab is like super loose these days. I do, I do a lot of obituaries, sadly. Uh, and I do stuff around no contest and then here and there I'll, you know, do a, a story. But for the most part, my relationship with them is mostly just doing no contest. And that's sort of by design so that I can live in Hawaii and be on the road a certain amount of the year. And, and that project for me is like everything that I like about working with stab is being able to put local stories on like an international platform where they wouldn't otherwise live. You know, a lot of stories that might've shown up in like a European surf magazine or in a local South African magazine for years that like the mainstream surf audience doesn't know about. Mm. Those are my favorite stories. It's, it's the equivalent of like being a food writer and the difference between like going and giving like a good review or a bad review to a super famous restaurant or like pointing someone in the, in the direction of like a really like cool roots, locally owned, family owned business or restaurant that all of a sudden, like there's this new energy towards what they're doing. That's positive to me. That's like the pinnacle of the like type of journalism, storytelling, filmmaking, whatever you want to call what I do. That to me is like the best utility of it for me, like the most good and like, uh, the most love that I can spread towards the right directions, I feel like I can do with that project. And I feel like STAB supports that. And that's a big part of it. Um, and then beyond that, it's just sort of project by project. I'm, I've been working on an acid test with Kelly forever that we filmed like 15 minutes of that Sam's always hounded me about whenever I talk to him. But uh, beyond that, it's just sort of project by project. And then I work with a bunch of other different, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a bunch of different other things. If you want to get into that. I think we will. I might save it for okay. the, the next section though. Be, oh, but I can say what's going on with stab now. That would be, yeah, cool. yeah, that's cool. But yeah. also I yeah. think too, just, just with your trajectory as well, I appreciate you outlining the editor at large. I think that makes a lot of sense, but ostensibly you sat in the big chair for a period of time. You were the EIC and, and that carries with it quite a lot of weight. And I think after you, I'll probably get the order mixed up, but I think Taylor Paul was in there at one point, Brendan Buckley, and now Mikey C. Um, curious whether or not you'd ever want to go back to the big chair or if there were things you were happy to leave behind. And then secondly, I mean, you, you were very successful there too. Do you ever do the, do the, did the other editor in chiefs ever come to you for guidance or did you ever offer it freely? Um, yeah. My question. Um, would I ever do that? I mean, I loved doing that job for as long as I did it because I basically just didn't say no to a project for like five years That's and right. just like went nuts. I didn't have a house. You know, I was like living out of the office most of the time. I was just like using it as like, I wanted to suck the blood out of that role as far as like what I could do and where I could go. And at a certain point that got pretty exhausting. And, and just trying to do a lot of different roles and a lot of different projects with no contest. I, it was like, it was, I knew that I could like sustain myself for a long time and, and stay inspired within that space, doing that project. Um, with being at the editor, you know, being the editor in chief there, it was, it was interesting because I, because I was so focused on the film side of things and really like pushing us to try and do, um, full length videos and to do like deeper storytelling within the films. Uh, I felt like I might've taken my foot off the gas a little bit, like editorially. Like if I was to just run a surf magazine that was just editorial and words and photos and like the traditional surf media, um, I would have done that job a lot differently, mm -hmm. but I was lucky because Buck and Mikey and, you know, Morgan, and there was all these guys who were like unreal, as far as productivity, like the stab ecosystem is insane as far as turnaround and churn and how much you have to get done in a day. And, you know, they were putting out like seven to 15 stories a week at one point when it was still about, you know, getting people to the website and, you know, that sort of like churn of news cycle stuff. And now it's about getting out a quality stab premium product every week, mm -hmm. um, if not more. 
And it's an incredible like feat, in my opinion, for them to be able to do that. Even like you look at the New Yorker, uh, even the New York Times, like they'll do a cool video feature here and there for their subscribers, but it's not like something that you can count on every week. They've got podcasts and all that stuff like dialed. Right. But as far as high quality, like, you know, films, documentaries, interviews, it's got to be one of the most productive media spaces within a subculture that exists. I mean, definitely alongside Thrasher or anything else, as far as like what they're producing and helping to get on their platform. Um, so yeah. So nowadays Mikey's running it, which is rad. Mikey's living in Costa Rica and him and his wife, uh, they just got married this year, Anna. And yeah, he's Carrie. He's decided to put that weight on his shoulders. It is, uh, it's a daunting task dealing with that ecosystem for anyone that's done that job. It's a nonstop 24 hour. You're on the clock. There's, it doesn't stop. The internet never, ever sleeps. And because of that, there's either something that needs to get done or something that has gone wrong or a fire that needs to get put out right. or, you know, this, that, or the other, it's a constant thing. And Mikey has been a workhorse for so long. Um, and he's one of the smartest people I've ever worked with. He's such a like unique and singular curiosity about surfboard design and like competitive surfing, like his specific interests are, uh, he's like a, an absolute like encyclopedia about shit. And so I think that, you know, for him, it's like a great role for the time being that he's stoked to be able to live in Costa Rica and then bomb around traveling, producing the projects that he needs to do for them. Um, I know he's been like doing all the, the reality show stuff, stab highway and stab high and all that stuff, um, which <laughs> they look like so much fun, but Oh my God, would they be miserable to make every time I, that I talk to those guys, I'm like, I'm so glad I got out before we had to do, I had to do road <laughs> rules. Holy shit. It's a different, uh, it takes a different animal. I think, you know, like one, yeah. of the, one of the things I'm interested in with your role historically and, and current is the even outside of surfing the debate between documentary and then documentary that's also executive produced by the subject it's on which people tend to bristle and go like well that's about access you know and a as a consumer of content i haven't i mean i guess i've had to be on the other side of the lens a few times but it's I, I see value in both like sometimes depending on the topic and depending on how well it's made it's like yeah, I want this to be the unauthorized version because I don't want like a sanitized version of the story. I want the truth. And then other times it's like, you can really feel the subject's absence in the actual content. It's a bummer, you know, like, and I'm curious where you fall both on the debate and if you have any examples in any direction in terms of your time working at STAB because I do, right? And we deal with, access is currency in our world, right? And it's one of those things where it's oh, like, yeah. yeah, we want to be professional, we want to be objective, but at the end of the day, we have to get the job done. I'm curious what your experience has been with it. Um, there's been a handful of, uh, I mean, there were probably times where that was like a weekly occurrence of like having to like see, having to like have come to Jesus talks with people, no name, I won't name names, about why you can't write a story about what someone told you about someone, usually without calling the person that you're writing it about and talking sure. to them about it. And just sort of principle number one, I think that like, I don't care who, you know, like how salacious of a journalist you want to be. If you call someone and try and talk to them and they don't talk to you at the very least you tried. And it doesn't give you carte blanche to say whatever you want or to like print whatever someone else told you anonymously or whatever. But, um, yeah, there's been a number of times where it's been just sort of like pointlessly cruel or, you know, unnecessarily like negative. And it's sometimes it's ridiculous, you know, like the things that people get mad about. Um, but sometimes it's like pretty obvious, you know, I won't name names, but like we were doing an episode on a contest and needed access to a world champion surfer who rides for Red Bull. And they were giving us access to go and film them like cooking food and doing all this fun stuff around the event in Bali at Karamas. And Mikey published a story, the headline of which was this person needs to learn how to pick their nose. And it was because the like 
nose pick reverse that they'd done was like a 90s nose pick and not right. like a modern below tail and whatever, you know, reverse. And they're furious. They're like, I just gave you my time, like, because I'm associated with it. Because right. I'm like whatever yeah. the editor in chief of Stab, even though it's like I'm in Bali, like trying to put together a shoot and you know host people at a dinner that we're like filming while this stuff's going live and like having to react to it in real time. You're like me, like it's just like potholes that you'd never expect to see coming. Um, it's interesting but, that I'll go ego on. Sorry. No, but I think that part of what I'm proud of, it, amongst a couple of things, one, like not having the girls section on the website, trying to either take the like real like meanness out of the gossip and the like be- the blood feud stuff and all that, and like at least like paint a fair portrait of whatever the incident was, you know, yeah. um, when those stories came up. Because admittedly, like, you know, four or five years ago, that was like what pushed you know, everything before you could post Instagram stories or videos. It was, you were trying to drive people to your website to find out what happened. Right. Um, but one of the big arguments I've always made is you get in trouble when you publish stuff that has anonymous sources and you don't talk about who told you this, that, or the other. I think the success of a project like how surfers get paid, which it's funny. I was just texting with Sam McIntosh and he was like, Oh, great job on no contest this season. I was like, Oh, cool. Maybe, Maybe I'll go a week or two without someone complimenting me on how good how surfers get paid is because I have nothing to do with it. It's like Sam's golden child. But it was a, you know, it came out of the fact that there's all these stories that exist within surfing, contract negotiations and beefs and all this stuff that if you just go and drudge up like a third party account of it or talk about it, it's like petty and no one's interested. But if you get this, each person to sit down and speak to camera and like lay it out, what it, you know, like the real story, one, no one gets upset at you, the filmmaker. People speak candidly and are open and actually like speak truth to camera, which I think you've seen in that series. Mm-hmm. And you get a real story. Sometimes it might, you know, people might be upset about it. I'm sure there's people that have been in that film that are not happy about their portrayals in it. But for the most part, I think everyone feels like, I said it, you know, like, whereas normally that would be stuff that would reflect upon stab for reporting anonymously about a story, whatever it was. Um, And so I think that's why people love that series so much is they're like, Oh, it's, it's honest. It's such a good point. And it's something It's funny. I, like Sam and I were talking about something not too long ago and the anonymity component came up just in general. And, and I get it to a degree, but I was kind of saying, look, I don't, most of most everything that happens in the surfing world every day around the world is not life and death. It's not state secrets. We're not hunting terrorists. We're not releasing hostages. And, and the anonymity thing, you know, whether it's sort of like pseudonyms in the comment section or on Twitter or anonymous sources, I always baffles me. Cause I'm like, you know, you're out there, you put your name on what you say. I do it similarly in a different way. Like, and I just don't think there's any instance, and certainly not that I've read, where it's like anonymous source said that. It's like, really? Like, put your name on it, you know? Or like, it's like, yeah. we're, we can all have an adult conversation about it. It's it's interesting. And I think something else you said made me think of it. Like, it does feel, and this is certainly not leveled at every single person in the surfing world, but there is a general sense of insecurity, I think, in, in surfing and in professional surfing and across every dimension of it. You know, and I think a lot of that is because so much historically has been a little bit based on artificiality, right? Where it's like, why are we paying this person that versus that? Well, there are some quantifiable things, but a lot of times over the course of history, it's been like vibes, right? And I think that's led to people being pretty sensitive over those vibes because there is a real world component to it that's been allowed to... um, you know, exist in the surfing world. And I remember we talked about this on a previous podcast, but certainly he wasn't the first, you know, there's Derek Hines power rankings or whatever. But when Lewis Samuels started post-surf, I remember the atomic bomb that went off on tour because for the first time in pretty much all of their lives, someone was being critical, you know, either fairly or not, but they were like, who would say this about me? No one's ever said this about me. And 
it was good content, you know, and that, it's just one of those things where it's like if people are a little more secure in their, um, you know, it, just in their lives and in their value, then having a conversation where someone said something about them needing to improve their nose pick is probably okay. Again, it, to me, it's all, and I've always stressed this, like whenever I've sat in that chair, as far as being the editor, it's always been like, it has to be funnier than it is cruel. Like mm. that's, or smarter than it is cruel even. And I feel like Lewis was always like right on the button with that. Like right. what he was writing was like so clever and witty. And it was never like, it was never like gross or, you know, it was, it was fair criticisms written with literary references and movie references and like subcultural stuff drawn in the way that like any good, you know, it's like, uh, someone that, yeah, I don't know, like Grail Marcus writing for mm. Rolling Stone or something like that, or like Lester Bangs. Like you can't get upset at them talking shit about something if they're doing it in a funny way. Like even the band's got to appreciate that they took the, that they took the time to think about it that long. Well, know? and doing it from a place of love in a lot of ways, if not yeah. so much for the band or the athlete or the subject, for the the center of gravity around which that revolves, you know, like and yeah. for surfing, it's like, yeah, like the center of gravity we're talking about here is world class surfing and however you want to define it. And as you pointed out, there's it's worth having those kind of criticisms. I think it makes everything stronger. It's it is interesting. You mentioned that you're uh, you're working on some other projects these days. You want to can you well, give us a on. hint? We, we 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 profiled Lewis in the San Francisco episode and went and hung out with him. I hey, mention. well, let's talk about that. What is he doing <laughs> these days? So Lewis works for a tech name, a tech company that will not go named. And I'll butcher what his job description is. It's like a game of telephone because it is that complicated. But right. from what he's explained to me, he is like a cultural ethicist for. <laughs> Sorry, I can't say that. Let me say that one more time. Can you? Can we can. We can. We can. What we should yeah. do is just um, bleep it because <laughs> it'll be funnier. <laughs> okay. So he's he's basically like a, a, a cultural ethicist or like a cultural scientist that works on the artificial intelligence side of their business, basically like giving reports on like how people can humanely interact with artificial intelligence in the best ways and not create damaging technology out of it, um, which I don't know why I see like weird comparisons to what he was doing at PostServe and with his blogs and stuff. He always tells me these stories about how you know, part of his, it was like, he always calls it an art experiment, but I think that the joy for him was just the freedom of like total open expression about it. But what happened for him was that the comment section became so negative and gross and weird that at the time his wife was working at basically like an insane asylum for prisoners that were too crazy to be tried for murder. And she was like witnessing like real crazy in real life. And then having to see Lewis deal with someone like talking crazy bullshit and like threatening him online at the same time. And he was like, nah, I can't, right. I can't bring any right. more like crazy and negativity into my life. Um, and so Lewis has like the most beautiful, like quiet life that he's built up in the house that his family built North of San Francisco. Um, it's like a full seventies redwood panel windows, like looks like a, like a log cabin in the woods. And drives down to the city, um, chases barrels at Ocean Beach and up north and all these misto spots that will not go named. And yeah, has his family. I think he goes on a couple surf trips each year. And then every once in a while, he'll write like an epic story for like Esquire or, right, you know, right. like a major magazine about, you know, where surfing is intersecting with, you know, mainstream culture. But yeah, he's doing great. We, he was at the premiere with Marcus Sanders um, the San Francisco episode talks about like tech and how it's affected San Francisco and how it's affected surfing at large, mainly with like surf line and surf forecasting and stuff like that. So it was cool. We got to like sit down with Marcus who's lived in San Francisco forever. And who's one of those guys who like, I don't feel like most people have ever seen the like editor of surf line. You know right, what I mean? Like right, I'm, yeah. I've, as an editor in chief, Sam was always like, you guys have to be in front of camera. Like that was part of our roles from day one, which most of us were really uncomfortable with for the longest time. Marcus, I feel like I has seemed always uncomfortable to be on camera. And then when we put a camera on him, he was so f charming and such a good storyteller. And yeah, he was great. Um, and yeah, it was that episode was rad just because San Francisco 
before I moved to Hawaii, I did like 10 years in San Francisco. And besides here, I spend the most time there just because my brother and my nephew are there. So mm -hmm. I'm there like three or four months out of the year. And I know the like nuances of that culture and that scene and that community. And it's the, to me, it's like the best city in America to be a surfer. No offense to Los Angeles. Um, but only because you have to go through the process of getting to know a number of groups of people in different categories within the surf scene there, whether they're guys that work at, you know, in tech, like Mark Valenta, who's one of the creative directors at Adobe or mm. the guys from Mollusk in San Francisco, uh, in the sunset, it's like this, you know, artist collective and, you know, probably the best selection of surfboards on the West coast of, as far as like hand shapes and, you know, uh, alternative or esoteric surfboards. Um, and then just, you know, surfer owned restaurants and it was rad. We got to cruise with Maddie Lopez. Have you ever met Maddie Lopez throughout the years? I have not. No. Maddie's like probably one of the only, like, he's a third generation San Franciscan, but he's like one of the OG, like second generation surfers. His dad was a surfer from the sixties and seventies, but he's one of those guys that like every winter will get like the biggest barrel at ocean beach, like a clip of it from five angles and like local hero status, like Surfline will run a gallery and it'll always be like a one wave of Maddie just getting blown out of like a 20 foot pit at ocean beach or Mavs or anyway. He's just like one of those like underground guys. Um, and he's actually my, he used to be my brother's neighbor, um, in the neighborhood and owns this bar called pits. That's like this old sketchy dive bar that he like completely revent, like revamped, renovated, kept its total original charm. And it's like the perfect mix of like divey, gritty, like sort of dark San Francisco vibes with like perfect local, like surf history and culture and like sports stuff from the city and it's the raddest little bar so we, we were able to do a bunch of like local business profiles and character profiles and um lewis took us to meet peewee um this guy his name's bill bergerson he's the the protagonist or i guess the antagonist in uh playing doc's games in bill finnegan's new yorker piece oh, really? um so there's there's doc renneker and Pee Wee and Pee Wee's the guy that's like, don't talk about it. Don't tell people, don't film it. Well, I can just go surfing like OG core Lord. And we got to go interview him, like sitting against the like brick wall at Fort point with Maddie and Lewis, like going through like the whole history of San Francisco surf culture from like when that was still a military base and they would give you tickets for surfing and chase you out of the water with guns and surfing without wetsuits and stuff. Um, and he's 70, just turned 70, still rips Surf's Ocean Beach when it's big. And they put together this like amazing film, a bunch of his friends did, of like all this footage from the 90s and all these old photos for his 70th birthday that he sent us that we got to use some of the footage. And it's like the most timeless surfing, like 90s long, like Hawaii guns being ridden by like sort of Derek Hines style 80s surfers like 10 foot ocean beach, perfect glass. Um, and I think probably the era now that I think about it, that, that I think Bill would have been there writing that piece. I need to, I don't remember what year that came out, but, um, I'll have to look, I know he started writing it at some point in the eighties, but, um, but yeah, just like the most timeless archival footage, which for me, like doing no contest, like trying to find period correct footage when they're talking about history is like so challenging. And it was just like a gold mine. Um, so it was really cool to premiere that at, you know, in, we premiered it in San Francisco and almost all the locals were there and it, it's always super stressful for me doing stuff like that, where I'm like, fuck, I got to get this right. Like, right. uh, I felt that pressure, especially like we did a premiere in New York last year, the same thing where it was like, I'm trying to capture this whole scene that like, there's kind of not necessarily infighting, but there's like, you know, there's, there's def there's different clicks and scenes and I'm trying to capture all of it because in a weird way, I'm like a diplomat amongst everywhere I've traveled at this point. I just feel like I know everyone in every little scene. Um, and that was definitely the most like complicated episode to get right. Um, and I think we did. I think people are like pretty hyped on how the episode came out. We were able to lean on like an amazing archive of that zone that was shot by Perry Gershko and the late Chris Wilson of Power Lines Productions, hmm. who there's very few people that have like documented san francisco and and mavericks as well as those guys up there kyle boothman and that whole crew um but like i said that in the film it's like 
a few days a year. It's the best beach break in North America, but it's very, very rare. Um, so it was you, cool to you, like show You brought it. up something interesting there though, like, and, and it does feel like maybe this is an interesting kind of bow to put on this segment of the conversation because you've done quite a different, quite a lot of different things in, in storytelling inside and outside of surfing. It feels like for you personally, you've gravitated towards a medium and a pace that requires time and space to get done. Um, so you can go deep, right? Which is really at odds with modern media landscape in some ways, in terms of we have to feed the beast every day. We need social media content every day. We need you know, website content every day. Is that a fair assessment? And, and secondly, um, do you feel like you're going to kind of continue on in this space or would you ever revert back to like high frequency kind of stuff? No, I think that anything that I make nowadays, especially with, you know, within the surf space, like I want it to be something that like people remember, you know, mm -hmm. and with no contest, I want it to be something that like for a long time, people in that community, like think of it as being like a really like important milestone and like a celebration of their scene, especially with the local focus of the last two seasons. It's like, I feel like it's like a, an ecosystem that we've built that I get, re you know, now I get reached out to all the time by people in different locations saying, oh, come to Ecuador, come to New Zealand. Like we want to do an episode, you know, it's like, I feel like it's like this, it's built this network that like people now want to be a part of. And that for the local community of people in all those locations, it's helped drive business or help, you know, get them sponsorships or get support for different things. And and actually this next year we're going to be, I'm working with um, a company called Thermal that was started by a friend of mine named Drew, who was uh, a part of like kayak.com and that kind of stuff, who's helping me do these like residencies in each location where people will be able to come and basically have the same experience that I've had with no contest. You spend time with the locals, the different stars from the episode is, will be the guides to each location and we'll have week long slots throughout a month with, you know, a board residency with the different brands that we're going to be working with, but basically have it be where it's like a competing, a trip to a boat trip, but all the money goes to a local community, like directly to local businesses, local hosts, local guides and local restaurants. Um, and where people leave feeling like they've really like learned and become like familiar and like sort of in a weird way, like the, the same way that I feel like they have like a real strong, like almost family connection to these locations because they've spent time with the people that like make it what it is. Um, and so we're working on putting together those packages for, I think the first one's going to be in Pavones in May, um, which we shot an episode on last year. Um, and then Mexico, Morocco, and Tahiti. Um, it looks, but we're still working out the details, but for me, it's about trying to help develop like a, of actual like financial ecosystem around these locations that these guys can tap into so that people can go and experience these places the way that I have with them um, and invest that money instead of going to the four seasons or going on an all inclusive, you know, luxury trip into these like vibrant local communities and people that are running really cool businesses sustainably and sort of consciously in these areas. Um, guys like Tahure Henry, who I'm sure you guys have worked with in Tahiti doing water safety and stuff, but you know, his family, you know, own and operate one of the most beautiful little homestays and for people to be able to go and like have that experience with them and a visiting crew of pro surfers for a week at a time. Um, it's the idea is for you to get a pretty like unique behind the curtain perspective and to come away feeling like you've really gotten to know the place. So, which is what I hope comes through in the episodes is that like when you finish the episode, like you have a sense of not just, you know, what the waves are like and when to go and like the best sessions from the last few months, it's like who made the place, what it is, like, where do you go? And, you know, like who are the people that are important to the community and what are their stories? If, we can sort of give people that experience on a surf trip. That would be the like dream for it. I love it. We're going to take uh, one more quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we will wrap it up when we get back. Be right back. That's it. All right. We are back. This is the lineup. I am Dave Proden. I'm here with Stabs Ashton Goggins. We've been talking about the new season of No Contest, which is available to stream on Red Bull TV. We've also been talking about 
Ashton's career as a storyteller within the surfing world and the mediums that excite him and the projects that excite him. One of them has been one of the more popular projects from STAB, the Electric Acid Surfboard Test, which is releasing its new season this week with Western Australia's Sean Bad Manners. Ashton, for listeners who are unaware, tell us about how this concept came to life and then what can you tease uh, to us about this upcoming season with Sean Manners? Yeah, so the acid test weirdly like predates even my time at STAB. I, I'd always had this dream of like having a space, which is kind of what I'm doing here in Hawaii, but a space where like a surfer could come and basically pick through this like really eclectic quiver of surfboards and go and like tap into that experience that was like a completely new sort of feeling and experience. Uh, sort of world as far as surfboard design. And I was working with a friend of mine, this guy, Stevie, who owns a surf shop now called two to three and fair in Venice. And we were talking about the project and, um, I was, we were coming up with names and he went, how about the electric acid surfboard test? And I was like, that's the best name ever. And so we, you know, I, when I came to stab, I brought the project to Sam as like a spinoff of stab in the dark in creating basically like a, a, a completely non-traditional taste test of surfboards. If Stab in the Dark was like the master chef of surfboard design, then the acid test was supposed to be like this full, like sort of psychedelic trip down the sort of rabbit hole of alternative design, whatever you want to call it, um, non-traditional surfboards. Um, and originally I was like, you know, there was, there's people like, I think at that time, Mikey February and Torin Martin and Alex Nost and all these surfers that were like pretty high profile at the time for the types of surfing that they were doing on those boards as far as like high performance alternative surfers, Dave Rostovich. I think that a lot of those guys, like my favorite sort of narratives around any of them has been, you know, sort of what, you know, curiosity they entertain within different disciplines of surfboard design, Dan Malloy also. Um, and for me, it was about reverse engineering those moments. It was like, okay, how can you create those like Curran on a skip fry fish at J Bay moments? And what Sam contributed to the concept was for it to be a little bit like jarring. And the idea was that instead of it being like someone that you would expect to see on alternative boards, it would be someone like Dane or Noah Dean, someone who's like hell bent high performance. I mean, although Dane has done plenty of experimenting, it's 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 never been like him trying to push anything to the limit, I think, to a certain extent. Um, but so Sam was like, oh, I bet you I can get Dane to do it. He called up Dane and Dane was just, I think, nine months after giving birth to the twins. Um, and it was so it was his first surf trip back. And I tell people that it was like for me, I'm sure it was like what it was for Sonny Miller to watch Tom Curran surf J Bay for the first time, but watching Dane bottom turn on a Ryan Birch asymmetrical twin fin on like a four to six foot, like Mexican point break for the first time was like kind of a weird spiritual experience for me. <laughs> like I had like manifested this moment. And I think that a lot of people thought that that project was like some of his best surfing of like the past 10 years. And I mean, I, in person, it was mind blowing, but I felt like I was just like jaded by, you know, being there. You're like, you often wonder if it'll hold up on film and he ended up editing that project for me. Um, Sam went up there and edited it with him. And it, that was like the first like full length film that I really ever made. Now that I think about it, that was like my first full length surf film. Um, and we, you know, did a bunch of premieres with it and it was super successful. I think it, you know, at that point it sort of outpaced stab in the dark as far as like the interest from brands and like sort of where it went. Um, which is not the case anymore. Uh, I think that Stab in the Dark's gotten so good that it's like pretty much unparalleled. But um, it it definitely drew in a different crowd to the Stab ecosystem too, because I think for a long time they were seen. You know, Australia has always been pretty, at least for you know, starting in the early two thousands until fairly recently, the the mainstream Australian surfer was on like more, more likely than not a high performance shortboard. More more. Mm -hmm more likely than almost anywhere else in the world besides maybe Hawaii, I would say. Um, and these days I feel like, you know, maybe it's cause they're in Byron instead of Bondi now. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's like, they're very comfortable with, uh, alternative surfboard design being part of like the ecosystem of stuff that they're interested in. Um, 
and that project's been like pretty defining for it. I think, I think it's like helped make careers in a weird way or help define brands. In my opinion, I know that, uh, Matt Parker from album, when we first put him in the first episode, Dane ripped on his board, despite like hating the way it looked and not liking the color and like everything that it had going against it. And absolutely shredded the thing and like i think it ended up being the runner-up but it you know it, it piqued the curiosity of josh kerr and all these other surfers that started getting on his boards and all of a sudden matt's to my mind like probably the like the biggest success story as far as like developing a surfboard brand around alternative high performance surfboards um and uh, you know he's working on a board brand with a very famous surfer in Hawaii that's supposed to release here in the next few months that I can tease, but not say who it is. Uh, and he's like, you know, he's, I, I feel like it's been nothing but like a upward trajectory since that project for him. And I think that that is sort of like a blueprint now for, you know, people seeing someone engage with somebody else's like different design than they'd ever seen and seeing what that looks like. And that's sparking a huge interest in that design. Um, and we did the same thing with, with Simon Jones, with Stephanie Gilmore. I think that, you know, Simon's boards had a, like a really cult following. And then when Steph picked it as a winner and, uh, and Noah really liked it. And, you know, I think we got Chippa Wilson riding his boards too. It was like, all of a sudden it was like, he was one of the most like weightlisted surfboard shapers on the planet. Cause he still does it every board by hand. Right. Um, every one of those channels is like Simon in there. Um, and so, yes, for me, it's been like, that's been my favorite part about it is like helping to put shapers and board builders and laminators and airbrushers and like trying to do stories around surfboard design is my favorite stuff. Like whether it's the acid test or stab in the dark or, some of the projects around the Vans triple crown that we did with the pickup, like doing, you know, when they have the alternative board categories, like there's stuff that like when I get to go and like hang out in a factory and talk to someone that's glass boards for a long time or shape boards for a long time, I'm like a, a pig and man, I love it. I can just sit there all day and talk and it drives most people crazy. It drives the filmers crazy. We, you know, we'll shoot an interview with like Jack Reeves and Al Chapman or something like that. And I'm like, you can't turn the cameras off. Like, I'm sorry. I don't care how heavy it is. Like, this is your, this is your burden to carry. This is like history right. being put into your camera, like deal with it. Um, but yeah. then again, I get to like stand well, you, off the side with like my arm on something like casually right, talking yeah. for four hours at a time. Drink a beer. You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you mentioned some of the subjects for this particular project, you know, Dane and uh, Mason and Coco and Mick, what, are you expecting to see or what can, can, can viewers expect to see out of someone like Sean Manners tackle a project like this? Um, I think Sean's someone who has like a ridiculous amount of like, just sort of bored DNA in him from his dad being a, a shaper. And I think Western Australia has got a, it's like a pretty open-minded place when it comes to like weird boards realistically. Um, but he's just such a, like, he's like a Craig Anderson level, like, talent i think when it comes to like all categories you know he'll send it under the ledge he'll do beautiful open face rail surfing he can do it you know any air that you can name and for me i think it'll be exciting just because i always want to see these boards like push to their limit that was my mm -hmm. favorite thing about dane like having like having these boards put in real waves because for the longest time they were always, I think alternative boards were always seen as the boards that you rode when the waves were pretty, that you always rode your short board or your step up when the waves were good. And especially as, as people have become much more comfortable with boards, you know, between say six, two and eight foot, like this sort of whatever you want to call it, mid length range, longer board thing. I think that people have like had the real pleasure of realizing that you can, draw crazy beautiful lines and have tons of control on boards that aren't just your standard round tail three fin shortboard. And to me, it's like someone that's been sitting playing an electric guitar, playing the same three chords over and over again, like all of a sudden being given like a banjo or a mandolin or, you know, like a saw or something else to play where they're like, Oh wow, look at these sounds I can make. Like, I didn't even know I liked this. Um, to me, that's like part of the, like joy and is as far as like personal creativity and surfing my favorite things on the planet are like 
turning people on with surfboards, like whether in, in college working at Mollusk in New York or in San Francisco or with the acid test, like trying to think about what boards are going to turn someone on and then like seeing whether that happens or not. Even if it's just like an everyday surfer that asks me a question about what board they should get. Um, when I see that like positive interaction between someone opening their mind up to something and going and experiencing it within the context that I've tried to frame up for them, like saying, go and ride this board at this wave with this type of conditions and try and do this and showing them references, like trying to give them like the full sense of like why they have the board under their arm that they have. Um, for some reason, that's like my favorite thing because I feel like it's weirdly like a, it's like combative against this sense that most surfers nowadays don't know anything about anything. Mm. And I don't, you know, I have like a stack of magazines behind me for this project that I'm working on here called the center of radical education, which I think I sent you renderings for that uh, is going to be like a whole archive of every surf magazine and every surf movie ever made. And like a curated exhibition space around surfboards and, you know, surf history and culture but a large part of it for me is about being able to actually see in real time you know what people are talking about when they come in and talk about a single fin or a twin fin or a thruster instead of being like oh yeah this was you know relying on someone who could often be an unreliable narrator to explain surfboard design for them to be able to go in and actually see what all this stuff looked like and what those boards look like and what they're you know what the entire vibe of that of each era of surfing is um, as a, as a way of combating the like ignorance culturally, or I should say subculturally that most surfers that have learned how to surf in the like internet age where history sort of doesn't exist unless it's been sort of packaged within a short feature, you know, and something that you guys do or we do, um, they don't have access to, you know, all the stuff that we did growing up. They, they don't have that like tangible ability to go and like interact and absorb all the like granular surf history that I think our generation was able to, they might know exactly what every surfer of the last 10 years has done on social media, but they don't know, you know, why the IPA sting was invented and, you know, why Mark Richard, you know, just stuff that like, it might not seem important, but to me, it's what makes, what separates surfing from tennis, you know, it's like what separates rock and roll from elevator music. Um, it's all of the references and all of the subcultural capital that like has come to create the culture that you just sort of walked into. And I don't, you know, growing up as like a young kid around a lot of older guys in the surf scene or the punk rock scene or whatever it was, it was always like my like armor against feeling insecure around elders or people that were like, you know, higher status within a hierarchy to me was always about being as academic as I could about surf culture. And that was through surf magazines and surf movies and like paying attention to them. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, I actually have one box of like a huge cache of surf magazines. I like put it out there to a few people about I'm trying to build this, like a, you know, full authoritative archive of it. And this guy, Dan Dolan reached out he's lived here since the seventies and is moving to Australia to retire. And I told him about what I was doing and he's like, I'll stop by. And he brought by like 500 magazines, Surfer's Journal, Surfer, Surfing, Australian Surfing Life, Longboard Magazine, Scott Hewlett's first magazine before he took over the Surfer's Journal, like a bunch of surf videos, like all this stuff, like just fully like brought it over. I was like, oh my God, people get it. Like they, they, he's like, man, I just, this stuff just sits in people's garages and like collects dust. Like people should see this stuff. And so that's the idea is it'll be like a, you know, sort of library that people can come and look at this stuff and buy a cup of coffee and check out really beautiful surfboards made by Al Chapman next door or these like shaping residencies that we're going to do at Third Stone, the factory at the Y. Lewis Sugar Mill that I work with, um, with Steve Williams and the guys there that do Al's boards, Dennis Pang, Pizel, DHD, Lost, pretty much like all the major board brands in Hawaii. Um, and so it'll be like sort of a attached like partnership space between those guys. Um, When's it, when, what's what's going. the ETA on this uh, temple? So if you bring it here, buddy, it's it's going to be after after the baby boy in February. But I'm working on like renderings and getting all the design like sort of uh, 
nailed down. And then it's just about getting the, the budget and the investment all finalized um, to get the building built. But in the meantime, I'm doing a bunch of stuff with Third Stone that's tied to the same project as far as shapers, residencies and stuff here in Hawaii. Um, part of what I'm trying to build is a little network through all the different factories that I've worked with over the years doing the acid test and stab in the dark and all these different board projects um, to be able to have this exchange between regions of laminators and shapers and board builders. Um, so our friends in New York that run Pilgrim, they have a space across the street where they're able to host shapers. And then this, these two brothers, the King Street glassing crew have a glass shop right there. So during the summer, the guys from Hawaii can go to New York and build boards and do events there. And then during the winter, when it's too cold to build boards in the Northeast, they can come to Hawaii and, you know, glass boards with Al and, you know, do sort of like limited run production in each region um, so that the boards are sort of kept locally and built locally with, but still by the best surfboard shapers on the planet. Um, and so that those guys can go and spend time in those areas, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes, I mean, for me, it's, it's similar to no contest, like working in surf shops and like working within the surfboard industry, it's always been about like my favorite moments have always been being able to like experience a place through a visiting shapers sort of trip and living in New York. It was, that was like part of what I loved about working at Mollusk was that you would have Chris Christensen or Richard Kenvin who basically brought the mini Simmons back to like avant-garde in the like early two thousands. And, um, all these shapers that would come through because they were selling boards to all these like curious, you know, board guys in New York. And they would have like this incredible relationship to the community there that would order boards and, you know, welcome them back. And now for there to be an, inf an infrastructure for their people to be able to go and stay and really like do it right. Um, it's going to be cool to tap into. So it's going to be with those guys and then my friends in the Basque country at Pucas that they just finished their new factory. Um, the Pucas factory in Spain that was there for like 30 years burned mm -hmm. down and, 2017 i think yeah um and was the biggest environmental disaster in the surfboard building industry's history um and they i mean had an archive of boards from like 30 years of resident shapers coming through there every board builder from the early 80s to today uh like an archive of all the boards that they built um, and they've rebuilt as one of the biggest brands and really, I think in surfboard building, let me say that again, they've, uh, they've rebuilt into a, probably one of the biggest brands in Europe, if not the world, I think, as far as like a regional surfboard brand. And they do same thing, Channel Islands, Lost, McTavish, Christensen, and then all these esoteric brands like Fantastic Acid and Son of Cobra and, uh, eye symmetry, um, and have created this like incredibly rich ecosystem, um, building boards in the Basque country and distributing through Europe, through all these, you know, locally partnered shops. Um, for me, that's been like one of my favorite parts of my job is working in those, um, working with those factories and getting to know that world. Cause I've always wanted to work in the surfboard industry, but like, I'm not a shaper. I just like doing the storytelling around it. And so for me, it's like an, it's an opportunity to like curate all these people that I've worked with in these different areas to build really radical boards together. Uh, so that's what I'm working on with that. Very cool. And we know that no contest is streaming on Red Bull TV. We know that uh, Electric Acid and Stab in the Dark and a number of other projects you're involved with, um, that's stabmag.com. For anyone out there that's listening that wants to get involved with this project you're doing in the board building space and the magazine space and creating a, a physical place for people to come and, and, and experience surfing. Do you want people reaching out to you? Are you looking for involvement? And if so, how, how, <laughs> yeah, do, they, how do they get up. a hold of you? Yeah. There's no, there's no blue check next to my name. You can hit me up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If, if, if anyone's interested in, um, you know, anything that I've done around no contest or has any questions about any locations. Like I love chatting up people about surf travel and who they should go meet and all that stuff. Um, if they're interested in doing one of the residencies this year, um, you can go to thermal.travel slash no contest, uh, which I don't think that the landing page is like fully built, but it will, they're developing it right now. Um, and we'll be like filling in all the details as we lock in, like what we're going to do. 
Um, it sounds like we're going to have the album team in Morocco and Mexico potentially. And then I was just talking to, uh, to Tosh Tudor and your guys world longboard champs, uh, Joel Tudor and Justin Quintal about being down in Pavones for the month of May. Um, so we're just working out all the details on that. So all that's like still up in the air, but, um, it should be, they should be really cool. Pretty, they're going to be very unique experiences for anyone that's ever wanted to take a unique surf trip. Um, we'll score waves and basically like get to know a location like you would, if you were invited there by the most important people to the community, which is always like my dream when I'm showing up somewhere as a, as a guest and not a visitor. Um, and then as far as boards go, um, hit up Brit at third stone, uh, the crew at third stone, I think are like the best, they're my favorite little like epic ragtag functional dysfunctional family. Uh, and Brit is their shop manager and factory manager and basically has like a whirlwind of very, very lovable, mildly insane surfboard builders and glassers and OG shapers oscillating wildly around her throughout each day. And she somehow keeps the, uh, keeps the chains greased. Um, but she can dial in if you guys want to, uh, talk about ordering surfboards, uh, Al Chapman right now, like if, if, it, if ever there was a time to, to, for people to buy a surfboard, uh, Al Chapman is kicking hard right now, building boards and some of the boards he's been building out of the factory look incredible. Um, and he's one of the last of the original big wave cowboys. Um, Nate Fletcher introduced me to him a Years ago, when we were doing a project, he hadn't done interviews in probably 10 years since a lawsuit with the Surfer's Journal over a feature that Jeff Johnson wrote that basically said some things that he wasn't very pleased about and painted him in a, in a way that he, he was not excited for his mother to read about, I don't think. Uh -huh. And so we were able to get him comfortable and to like really start opening up. And over the last few years, we've been able to do a bunch of projects with him, building boards for us, um, taking us over to Jack Reeves glass shop, which the Jack Reeves, Mike Diffender for Dick Brewer, Al Chapman, like legacy is for me, like they're like the Beatles of, of surfboard design or the Rolling Stones, like the original cowboys of Hawaii, um, as far as board building goes. And the fact that those two still board build boards start to finish, resin tints, pin lines, like everything by hand still today, and that you can go and get one for not much more than you would for a mainstream brand new off the rack shortboard. Uh, it's a trip. It's like still being able to order like a Chevy Paula or something like that when you're going to shop for a, a Prius. <laughs> I love it. Well, before you go, we did put out a feeler for questions from the Instagram community that the live Oh pod. boy. That was the only thing that I've been nervous about. Whenever I see whenever I see crowdsourced questions, I'm like, oh boy. There's some good ones. Uh, we've whittled it down to three. Uh, first question is from at Rick Dev Ryan DT. Sorry, Rick Dev, I'm sure I butchered that, but his question or their question, excuse me, is of all the no contests you've done. Uh, where would you like to live the most? Where would I like to live the most? Um, probably Morocco. My wife would hate me for saying that, but I think Morocco is one of the places where the Morocco or Southern Brazil, I think eventually I will live in Brazil for a while. Same thing. My wife will not like me saying that, but um, yeah, as far as the combination of just like open, warm, cool community vibes and good waves and, affordable, you know, sort of lifestyle surrounded or whatever, as far as affordability of lifestyle focused around surfing, I feel like that Morocco for me is like the sweet spot. It's like the most consistent coast or South Africa. It's hard, man. Uh, yeah. I'm going to say Hawaii since I live here though. <laughs> I like it. That's a good answer. Uh, second question is from at K dot beachy who asks, who is the coolest person you've been able to meet? Probably Peva Levy, mm -hmm. the guy I was telling you about, but we were talking about in Tahiti. Um, yep. I, I, for some reason, like a character like that, who when you're in his presence, you're like, wow, this guy has like an energy. I don't know what it was like to meet like people that you perceived as being like holy people. But as far as like activists and people that have like, 
that have just like authority to them without being seen as like intimidating. There's like a sweet spot that that guy hit when we were interviewing him where I was like, man, I feel so lucky to be able to talk to this guy. And Peva is, you know, he's hosted everyone on tour over the years. You know, he's, he told these stories about like the first guys showing up for the gotcha pro and not having places to stay, literally just wandering around along the shoreline, knocking on doors nice. and him being like, Oh, come back in 45 minutes. My wife's watching TV. And it was, I want to, I forget who he said it was. Oh, I'm going to blow this. Uh, but basically that like, that was how it was. You just like, that's how the homestay thing started. It was like, they had to figure out a place to put everybody. Right. So fun. <laughs> um, and it's so rare that you see someone who's like stood firm in their integrity around, you know, the value of land when to, to own the entire valley of Chopes and to keep it preserved and wild when I'm sure that countless people have come and made exorbitant offers over the years to build a ridiculous development on that cliff overlooking that valley and that wave. Uh, he has this great line in one of the um, interview scenes in the Tahiti episode where he's like, the money's like sand, man. Like it goes, it's like the land still here. And like in the most simple terms, it was like the, it was like the polarizing difference between like greed and like stubborn, complete, like local pre like preservation and, uh, and like commitment to keeping a place wild and small and as you've been there. It's like, it's a, it's an ecosystem unlike anywhere else on the planet with one of the most freak waves on, in, on earth. And for him to be like the chief that's standing in front of the way of anything going wrong there. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was rad. It's a great answer. Uh, third question is from at Wes Weber four who asks if you had to surf a heat against a current CT surfer, who would you have the best chance against? I like this question too. Um, that's like it's like setting me up for an insult. Jack Robinson, I can f with Jack and give him shit nonstop, and he would he would he would try and like overplay it back to me and would over surf and fall and, uh, <laughs> but also just because it would be really fun to surf a heat with Jack. Uh, but yeah, that's, I don't know. I, like <laughs> it. I appreciate that you're game to answer. As you said, that's a, that's a, that could be a dangerous question. I'm into it. Well, thank you to yeah. everyone who wrote in and at the lineup pod, we are now down to our final segment. It is the lightning round. Uh, these are 10 questions that you have answered before and I have your answers from last time. So we're going to cross reference them. Right. <laughs> so you can answer as we'll quickly how... as you can. We'll see how much you've changed. It's been a, it hasn't been that long. But... It's like the, every, every seven years, you're a different person. Like every, every seven months, I'm a different person on the appearance of the lineup. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Uh, okay. If you can only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Quad. All right, that's the same. Good job. I've been riding. I've been riding these Griffin's Tepanic, like sort of '70s outline quad guns, almost as short boards when the waves even aren't even that big. And I've had them for years. I got one of the best waves of my life on one of them, like probably five years ago at Log Cabins. And I just got it back for my brother, and they're both like perfect glass on, like heavy glass quad fins. And I forgot how good those feel on a real wave, and it mm -hmm. like fully resparked my interest in just riding one design for a while because uh, I've been on like a full whirlwind of riding boards. I've got like asymmetricals from AH Vessels and Album. I've got twin fins from Hani Ovadia from Israel. I've got like a bunch of Pukas boards that they brought to Morocco. Like I've been on like a little bit of a spin out on surfboard design. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to like spend the winter riding like one or two boards. I like it. It's a great answer. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee or mud water now. Is that an option? I'm yeah, actually very sure. impressed. Yeah. Uh, and this is like non, this is not like product placement. This is genuinely my, like my second or third cup of it. Don't worry. We uh, don't go for free, free ads on this podcast. I'm into it. Mm. Um, no, we'll one, no one gets in the back door. <laughs> I, the you, last time you answered Ace Coffee, so I appreciate the update here. That's good. Where you there evolved? we go. Uh, burrito yeah. or pizza? Burrito. 
I'm sure I said pizza pizza. last time. There you go. Yeah. But I was just in San Francisco and I went, I I drove by uh, the old Cancun down in the mission and I wasn't even hungry. I was like, this, when else am I going to be here to get like a proper mission style burrito? Because supposedly the burrito was invented in San Francisco. I don't know if that's true. I have to fact check that. That was something that one of the producers on the show, Corey Stevens brought up and I was like, really? Because I always associated with like Lebanese wraps and all types of other things. But yeah, it was uh, carne asada and really good hot sauce guacamole like what it's a it's a it's all the best food groups and all the best spices wrapped up in one thing the great answer my my kids are always like hitting me on this question and i always say burrito because i feel like it's more versatile like it's like i can do it for breakfast i can do it for dinner you know um yep next question would be interesting if this is your same answer we're gonna call you out here last book you read Uh, I just read for the third time, but it felt good to read it again. Uh, A Pirate Looks at 50, the Jimmy Buffett uh, biography, or or 40, I'm sorry. 40? Is it? I just put it down. Uh, I I thought it was 50, but I could be wrong. 50, yeah. I I appreciate Uh, that you couched it as like, this is the third time I've read it. So if you had answered that last time, you would have been fine. But last last time you said the other story (laughs) by Richard Powers. Uh, that best book is amazing. I just, I just thrust that book on someone else too. Oh, good um, for you. The best surf film ever is, I'm going to say Sea of Darkness because I still think it is. I'm sure that's what I said last time. I'm just tired. But it's you not. know what I just watched? I was about, ba- you know, no, you know what I will say this time? I'm going to, I'm going to reframe this one. And this is what I think the best surf movie is after watching it. These colors taste like, taste like music by Sonny Miller and Nate Fletcher. I watched that movie the other day because I was showing someone some of Nate's old stuff. Yeah, I was like, this movie is so good. Like all the archival stuff, even the storytelling around it with Nate, I was like, fuck, this is so different than any movie back then. And I think it probably got like lost in the weeds because Nate's not like a self-promotional person. Right. It's not like First Chapter or any of those other like, or Circle One or any of those yeah. other Quicksilver movies that people remember from that era because I feel like he was like an outlier on that team at the time. Sure. But that movie, man, like with not as Coppice's art direction. And I was like, holy shit, this movie is insane. The soundtrack's amazing. Like all the footage of those early air shows and early Chope stuff. And yeah, uh, that movie is so good. So great these answer. colors taste like music. There's a, there's a rip on YouTube. Everyone go watch it. <laughs> yeah. Last time you said it was the original five, five by 19 and a quarter, which I feel like. Is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Good. I think, and I, and I probably made you specify whether it was surf movie or surf film. You probably did. Uh, <laughs> I'm into it. That'd be it. the I'm most pretentious it. answer I could give you. <laughs> what is uh, one wave you never have to go back to? You had a good answer last time, by the way. Venice Breakwater. Hey, was it Venice Breakwater? It's consistent. Uh, if you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life, um, the wave near my house that doesn't have a name with my wife who it's like a perfect right reef that no one surfs around right by my house where I can keep an eye on my kid. <laughs> uh, great yeah, I would say there or after Morocco, maybe Safi, I could surf that wave every day. If it, if it broke, if Safi broke every day forever, I would surf that wave. Sand by per- point. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Uh, best person to share a lineup with my wife. Good, same sure. answer. If it wasn't the same answer, I would have lied for you. Um, wouldn't yeah, my wife knows oversight. everyone in the lineups around here. I paddle out there like, uh, how's Julia? And like, no one even knows my name. <laughs> Worst person to share a lineup with? Hmm. Me, probably. <laughs> like free surfing in between heats. I've had the worst... I had the wor- I had such a shocker at J Bay this year when we were filming no contest. We showed up right before the event, and I got my my gear stolen, a wetsuit stolen, a bunch of stuff like as we were driving through. And so I was surfing J Bay like the day of the like the absolute swell of the season, like two days before the contest. It wasn't even two days before the contest, so I feel less bad. It was like a week before the contest, but it was firing. I was sitting out there in a spring suit. If you can imagine how cold that was. For like four hours, not getting waves. Everyone was getting waves. Like there was no inside scraps, nothing on a brand new shortboard that I never written for that I got from the CI guys. And this wave came through like 
someone got stuck behind and fell off and it was like on the button. And I like sort of like airdrop, took a chandelier on the head that like sort of broke on my head and whitewatered and made it around the section. And as I came up, Yago airdropped on top of me thinking that I was going to like go straight and not like pull up into it. Like, I don't know if he couldn't see me either, but it was just like, boom. And that was my first wave of the whole session. Like, boom. And Yago came up so angry uh, because he's had this happen before and in front of me, not to me, but to another person that works at Stab uh, and realized it was me and it was fine. But it was like an interaction that immediately was just like soured the whole session. And then finally I got one good wave and, uh, it took six hours, but the whole time I was out there, I was like, I used to be such a pest out here. This is like <laughs> karma for all the like two foot days that I caught like 60,000 little waves in, inside of everybody. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with that. A good answer. Uh, last one, finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by welcoming our baby boy into this world, man. I'm like so excited i feel like most of the people that know me pretty well uh especially my friends with kids have been just like like when's it gonna happen especially since you know with with julia and i it's been like on the wall forever but like it was it was in the stars so when it happened i was actually in tahiti when we found out and it was like a casual zoom call first time we tried didn't think anything of it like just going through the motions for the first time like never done it and there was people around. It was like a whole thing. Everyone knew the next day in the lineup, Michelle Perez was like, Hey dad. Yeah. Papa. Uh, so it, it definitely put like a surreal spin on the experience of finding out that you're about to have your first child because there was, there was no processing time. It was just like, boom, everyone knew. But uh, my friends down there, I, I was around when they were pregnant with their first kid um, to and Hinatea and they had their, uh, his name's Takehi. And he was just romping around like, and, and, you know, another friend had babies down there and it was like, uh, it was meant to be. So it was a, it was a pretty surreal experience that I will always remember. <laughs> Good for you, man. And congrats to you and uh, Julia again. And thank you so much for coming on Thanks, uh, the lineup again, man. And for all the listeners out here, make sure you are checking out No Contest on Red Bull TV uh and the electric acid surfboard test on stabmag.com and yeah just bother yeah. ashton on social media if you want to get involved <laughs> in any of his myriad projects yeah hit me up uh yeah thanks to the guys from red bull for supporting our contest it's like such a rad project to be able to keep doing as far as you know just telling local stories and um shining lights in spaces that don't necessarily always get the attention um and go subscribe to stab premium like support independent surf media can't complain about things being shitty unless you support good shit. I love it. Put that Thank in a t-shirt. <laughs>